So welcome everyone and thanks for coming. So uh, please don't worry about the long title. I think it will become clearer uh, as we go along the presentation. So uh, to start with, just a few quick words of introduction. So I'm Deb Malia, just call me Deb, and I'm, I will be co-presenting with Louis. Uh, we are both part of the, let's say, PMI AI data science group. And the slight, let's say, advertisement that we wanted to do here is uh, our open source, uh, let's say, contributions page. Uh, I think it's fair to mention that, you know, this is kind of a journey for us as well, because, you know, to come from, let's say, a big company organization where open source was banned or, you know, not allowed to be used at all five years back to where we are now, kind of like Isabel was mentioning in her keynote today, where we are trying to, let's say, apply open source, embark on an open source journey, contribute to open source, even use a lot of open source internally. So I think it's a bit of journey for us, and uh, we are all learning here. And uh, so uh, I would welcome you to check the site out. All our contributions, including the one we will talk about today, are here. So please join, please provide feedback. So, getting back to topic. Thank you. So, getting back to the topic that we want to talk about today. So, enterprise search, and why are we talking about it now? So, I mean, search is not new. I mean, with Google and all, we have been searching for quite some time, and it works. So, what is new with enterprise search? So. I mean, in terms of definition, it's just that, you know, just with the AI, let's say machine learning, natural language processing hype, it's basically an application of whatever advancement is happening in natural language search, machine learning, to search, and then it's applying it in the whole pipeline from ingesting different types of documents to, to you know, like understanding what type of document it is, to understanding what the user is trying to say, and then even like using machine learning to, uh, let's say, organize the information, which is like auto-tagging and things like that. So it's basically the application of NLP and machine learning to the whole pipeline uh, of uh, search. And why is enterprise search important? So, I mean, if you work in a big company, it's not very uncommon to find, let's say, people who are always complaining that, you know, I'm unable to find any internal information. It's, you know, the, our internal knowledge bases uh, systems are like a black hole. Information goes in and you cannot find anything. So enterprise search is, I would say, a bit more of a, you know, big company kind of problem where a lot of information is being generated, but... Uh, there's either no way to, or let's say people are wasting too much time in trying to find the relevant information, and it's very difficult to find it, find it in one place, find it in the format you need. So it's a very relevant problem, and that's why there's a whole, let's say, domain that is building up around it. So, so we might question that, okay, again, going back to the back to the question that, okay, we have web search, we have, you know, Google, we have Bing, which, uh, you know, works to a certain extent. So what is different with, uh, different with uh, enterprise search? So we go through a few parameters. So on the positive side, there's a lot less data. In the enterprise, okay, you still have a lot of data. It's kind of a black hole, but it's nothing compared to the data, the amount of data that is being generated on the web. So you would say that this is a positive side, there's less data to search. What is maybe on the negative side, or maybe you can say it's a bit on the gray side, is the, your end, let's say, the end customers of your search are your employees. And as you probably all know, I mean, employees are the most critical of their enterprise systems. So they are not easy to please, and they expect a lot of things to be done for them, whereas if you go to Google, you're probably willing to put the extra effort to, you know, find the right keywords and search again, but as an employee, you expect whatever search engine you are using to give you the right data the first time. So, the other thing which also makes it a bit more dif difficult is the different types of data that we need to search. So, in case of Google, let's say a simplified version, okay, you can uh, argue that there are different platforms and things like that, but end of the day, it's all web documents. 
Whereas in case of a company, you, sometimes you need to, you know, your search engine needs to understand and work over everything from, let's say, PDF documents to Word documents to the engineering CAD doc, uh, diagrams to everything. So the ingestion of data and the different types of, uh, let's say, formats that it needs to accommodate is really diverse. And this makes the whole thing quite complicated. The other thing is, like I mentioned, is that in most big organizations, there are very few, you know, like tags, how to organize data. So when people are generating documents, they are hardly tagging data. So the data is kind of out there, it's unstructured data, and there's, so there's no, you know, let's say, not a lot of investment into tagging this data, which kind of makes searching even more difficult. On the other side, of course, there are huge investments in search engine optimization where, you know, I mean, if you, if you, it's a completely different field in all together, but you try to make your website data or, or let's say whatever data you put on your website much more accessible to, to search engines. So it's kind of the other way around where in enterprises you basically do absolutely zero, whereas on the web search side you're really trying to make your data more accessible to search engines. The other one is uh, so rule-based access control and security. So again, in an enterprise, you cannot make like all data available to everyone. So you need to put like another layer of access control or visibility on top of the data, the search results that you show. And as we all know, like uh, rule-based access control or security on top of index data is not a done deal. So we are still, you know, the technology of how to, let's say, protect access to index data is not. Um, not, let's say, uh, fully there yet. And finally, this is again a bit of like uh, what we face and maybe in other big organizations that you see as well, people expect search to work, but there's no like, let's say, commitment to consider search as a key, uh, let's say, uh, you know, like a key uh, stream on its own and to put like dedicated effort behind it. So this is also what we see as a bit of like, uh, you know, the challenges on why we enterprise search is still so difficult. And on top of this, so on all the challenges, we want to enable something called natural language search. So, I mean, if you think about how you search Google today, I mean, you probably don't think about it or we are so used to it that, you know, you just think of the keywords and enter the right keywords. But ideally, what we would like to do in future with advanced, uh, let's say, advancements in natural language processing is to enable something called natural language search which is where, you know, just like we are talking here, you would like to be able to enter the, just a full sentence, and it should answer you the exact answer. So, I mean, Google supports it to some extent. It shows the relevant paragraphs now, but if you, I don't know if you can read the question, but it's like the, what is the most dangerous part of a fire, and it's actually smoke, which is there in the answer, but ideally the answer should be just smoke. So, I think we are not there yet. Where it works, where it can give very precise answers is, let's say, general knowledge kind of questions, like, you know, who is related to whom, who won this, more uh, this kind of things. But uh, as you know, behind this is, a, is something called knowledge graphs, which are often, like, manually curated by a lot of people, so it's not like a fully automated process either. So, I mean, full natural language search is still a bit experimental. And we just wanted to also highlight something that, you know, the whole natural language search and chatbots also have a nice intersection. So again, I mean, I'm quite sure you have all heard about chatbots, maybe used it to some extent, and be frustrated with it, which is uh, kind of the general experience. But uh, I think what, what we just wanted to show here is that uh, there's a nice intersection of chatbots and natural language search, although it seems that the people in the field there's people working on chatbots in, let's say, independently, and people working on natural language search independently without, uh, let's say, focusing on the intersection, which is quite interesting. So, if you consider, let's say, you know, in an enterprise, what is usually a chatbot use case? More often than not, it's basically the FAQs that you used to have, which is basically your simple, like, you know, question answer. You're trying to automate that in the form of a chatbot. So think of the FAQs as more like rule-based engines. You give a specific question, you get a hard-coded answer. The current chatbots, the, I'm not talking about the ones you see in ICLR or, you know, you did the ones not in NEPS, but let's say the current chatbots that are available in the Watson, the Azure, Google Dialogflow, which you use in the enterprise today, are something called intent-based chatbots. 
So in these chatbots, you usually start from the Q&A, which is basically, you know, you go through what the users have been asking in the FAQ type of questions. You provide it, you configure your chatbot engine with that, you provide variations, let's say five variations of the, uh, the, the different questions, and then you kind of train your chatbot engine based on that, and then the expectation is, or the only work it does, is that it's able, let's say you gave five variations, it's able to understand 50 variations out of it by applying statistical, let's say, closeness measures, TF-IDF, uh, things like that, you know? So all it is able to do is to work a bit on the natural language understanding part to see if the query you asked is close to the query it has been trained on, the questions it has been trained on. So it's very limited. But if you now think about what we try to do with natural language search, so natural language search is basically if you could just provide the documents, don't worry about extracting what questions people might ask about them. If you could just ingest the documents and the, uh, let's say, search engine could provide you the exact answer like we discussed before, you know, so what is the most harmful thing in a fire? It's the smoke. If the uh, search engine could actually give you the exact answer, you wouldn't need a chatbot engine in between, the intent-based chatbot engine in between, because you, know, you could just give it the documents, and when the user asks a question, it could give the exact answer, which is what the chatbot is doing. So in principle, if your natural language search worked, then you wouldn't need, let's say, chatbots would go to another level, and you wouldn't be so limited by training it on existing questions and things like that. So given, of course, Natural language search, like we discussed, is still in a bit experimental stage. So what we, what we see now is a bit somewhere in between. So usually, the chatbots we build kind of follow, or let's say if you're building a chatbot, you need to take this into consideration, where you need to have a fallback option. So you can start with a chatbot, you can start with, a, you know, let's say, your predefined set of questions and answers, but always have a fallback in terms of if the user asks something which is not in the scope of the questions you trained it on, then it can fall back on a knowledge-based search, which is basically you know, what we will uh, show today, or which is natural language search. So you always need to architect it like that. And of course, if even that doesn't work because it's not guaranteed, it can always fall back on uh, you know, like a human agent. or a, So uh, that still works. So, and just to complete the story, I mean, there's also something uh, which we see, we will see in a lot of talks in Berlin Buzzwords as well, where, you know, the focus is on, let's say, website search or product-based search. Again, this is something a bit different than web search or enterprise search, because here the focus is on finding products and not answers. So you're looking to find products, and, and your criteria is usually, let's say, rankings or reviews that have been provided by other users. So things like you know, learning to rank and things like that, those kind of libraries work very well for product-based search because we are relying on reviews rankings, but they are a bit different than, you know, uh, because in enterprise search, you hardly have people who are ranking, let's say, the, the, or providing reviews of what answers they receive. So with that background, uh, so what Louis will go through, let's say, a, a use case we had at uh, PMI and show the different, uh, let's say, trade-offs that you usually encounter while building a natural language search based on that, using fully open source components. So thanks. Thanks, Zeb. OK, so before we jump uh, into the details of uh, our pipeline and what we've been working on, uh, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of, of the use case that we have at Philip Morris. So basically. Uh, we have manufacturers that are working on the ground floor, and uh, they work on a daily basis on uh, many machines uh, with uh, very complicated uh, specific keywords. And uh, the idea of, of our project was to, um, to go just beyond a Boolean keyword or uh, data management systems where uh, people would just uh, type in the keywords that they would search, and they would be like, um, give me, uh, let's say I work on this line of production, and I want to make, uh, I'm working on uh, cigarette making machines, making machines. Um, and then we would need to go through the whole document uh, to, to search for information. Um, so here we're talking about uh, hundreds to thousands of, of operators, um, and, and the idea is that if you have someone that uh, is not used to uh, 
uh, the way people are searching uh, in the company. Uh, this might be a challenge for someone uh, that, is, uh, that is reaching the company. Uh, so, ex um, example of, of uh, the answers that we would expect is something uh, that, that is closely relating to this. So, uh, if we had something like uh, typical documentary retrieval, uh, we would just type the, 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 the query. Uh, then, if we were looking for this kind of information, like how many knives are there on the drums, uh, it means that we would need to go through all the whole uh, text and the whole NC here. It's, it's 357 pages, so uh, then you could, of course, control F, uh, index the pages, but uh, the idea is that we really want to have this, this cognitive search where uh, the user just type in his, his question and, and we get through uh, right into, into the answer. So this is a typical question answering task, and uh, a reference uh, of question answering is the Squad da data set. Um, that's the Stanford question answering data set, and um, it's, it's 100,000 uh, question and answers that have been la labeled, and uh, it's, it's, all, it's all related to Wikipedia articles, so it's very open domain. And uh, the idea is to uh, use this, uh, what, like, what could we what could we use in this uh, in this task to to apply it to our use case? Um, one of the funny the funny thing is that uh, it's been state of the art and, and uh, I mean the state of the art uh, actually beat the um, the human performances. So we've been looking at DRQA, uh, which uh, has been built by F Facebook AI research team, and the idea um, behind the RQA is that it's a two-stage pipeline, where at first we would retrieve the documents that we want to look at, so that we don't have uh, too much to read, and then we go through the document using uh, neural nets to, to read the document and find the answer related to our question. Um, this, is on, this is open source, this is on BSD license, and uh, the good thing is that uh, we have a pre-trained model, uh, which we just can uh, basically use as black box. Uh, so, a few details about DRQA. Uh, so, the document retrieval part uses uh, Bigram TF-IDF. Um, I really suggest that you have a look at TF-IDF if, if you don't know what this is, but uh, basically it's, it's, uh, it's very intuitive and it looks at the frequency of words inside the documents. And uh, after this, so after the document retrieval part, we would uh, get a set of uh, pages or documents, and then we would uh, ingest this into a neural net. Here it's a recurrent neural network, and it uses uh, bidirectional units so that we have uh, information from the future and also from the past. Um, okay, so few words, and this is, this is just to show you how easily it could be implemented on your own corpus. Um, basically, in two lines, we would get, uh, be done with, uh, with the document retrieval by just uh, calling these two lines, uh, building the TF-IDF, having this uh, beautiful matrix with, uh, that we can uh, have the similarity with the, with the query. Um, then we put this TF-IDF in, in the pipeline, and, um, and we also use a model that we can just get online, and, uh, and we, would have, uh, we would be able to answer questions either related to our corpus, or we could basically answer questions that are related to, uh, to Wikipedia. Now, um, if you remember about the use case that we had, so the question was that whether we could uh, assess all the pain points that we had by just uh, not taking Wikipedia articles, but instead of this, ingesting our own uh, manuals. So for that, we use, um, because you cannot just take PDF and just ingest it into the pipeline, uh, you have to uh, read, uh, we, we use uh, Apache Tika, which is uh, actually, so that there, there are many crawlers out there where you could just um, uh, crawl all the data inside, inside, inside the, uh, uh, a, a data path, but the idea is that here we wanted to read pages and not 400 pages long documents, um, because then for the model it would be just uh, too much of memory. So, uh, so we use this uh, this uh, Java toolkit, and just to give you some some numbers, um, so on the reference paper, 
the document retrieval part had 78% accuracy. Uh, it's a P at five, sorry. So the idea behind the, the procedure at five is that in the top, top five documents, we would have at least one document that is relevant. Um, when we applied it on, on, on our uh, corpus, um, it happened that we, we ended up with 76% uh, of, of precision at five, which is not that bad, but uh, when you come to the stakeholders and you, uh, you, you tell them about these kind of numbers, they're not happy with it because they want to have something like 95%. They want to always uh, be able to find information for them. 76% wouldn't, wouldn't be enough. Uh, another thing is that, okay, we're uh, not providing the exact answer all the time, but uh, we're not here, we're not doing voice recognition, we're not using Siri or whatever. Uh, the idea is more about to be more granular in the, in the, in the answer that we give, and, and um, that's why we wanted to first prioritize the document retrieval part and not the reader part. Um, so because we wanted to focus on this, we... Um, introduced uh, Elasticsearch to the pipeline instead of the background TF-IDF. And um, for those who are not familiar with Elasticsearch, uh, I'm just going to give you a quick, uh, quick overview of, of Elasticsearch. So it's basically um, a distributed uh, search engine, and uh, it has um, many benefits. But uh, why we used it is because um, it's highly sc scalable, so if we have thousands of users, it would be beneficial, but also it has a very clean API. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very easily used for full text search. We can uh, change many settings, so for a research perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very useful. And, um, and, and also another thing is that there are many people using it, so... Um, this was good for us. So what we did is uh, we completely got rid of the TF-IDF, and instead we go through um, uh, an index that is Elasticsearch, and uh, you can just have it anywhere uh, on the cloud or uh, on-prem. Um, so we 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 added uh, we did a pull request on the on the RQA uh, uh, repo, and got accepted. Uh, the way it works is is, is very simple. Uh, you just uh, make it point to the the model the the index that you want, and um, and you also would add uh, the content that you want to cro to to read. Um, it can be anything. Here I'm just showing the content, but this could be also uh, the author, uh, the the name of the file when it has been last modified. So any kind of field you could think, any kind of metadata that you could think of, of uh, about the, the, the documents, uh, you could search in. And, and you can also tweak the weight. So really, there is, there is a lot to, to, uh, to experience here. Uh, we, so using this, we had a jump of, perf of performance to 84% for the reader part. Um, and then in the end, uh, we had something like 42 um, uh, F1 score, which is basically the distance between the answer that we're looking at and uh, the actual uh, the the answer that the answer that we get from the reader part. So uh, if we compare this to the reader part of the reference paper on the RQA, they had nearly 80%. Um, so there's there's a gap between the two, but if we look at closely uh, what what we're getting from the answer, it actually happens uh, most of the time that the the answer is. Um, is just uh, around what we're getting. So if we look at uh, more of a context of the answer that we're getting, we, we have like 94% uh, in the first results of true answer. So before, um, before I give you the, the takeaways and the learnings of, of, of all of this, I just want to show you what uh, was the end product in the end. Um, so the, the idea is that we still have a search engine where uh, we could go through the document. We have this preview on the right. We have uh, filters on the left, anything you can think of, and everything is automated. So um, if the file has, uh, has metadata on about, for instance, what line of product they would use, um, then you could leverage this. And, um, and, and also it, it brings also uh, the DRQA part uh, on, on the front end. So this is, was just to show you how we, 
we can try to address those pain points and, um, and how we combine the document retrieval part with the question answering task and, and try to build a search engine which we call natural language search on, on, on this. Um, so the few takeaways from this is that, okay, some, some of, most of the time you will not get the, the exact match of the answer that you're looking at. But um, most of the time, you will have the right context. And uh, if you don't have the right answer, at least you have the right page or the right paragraph, which is a great thing. And I think that's what most of the people want. Um, we buy with the front end. And I think we should never forget about the, the user experience here. So I mostly talked about the back end. But um, if we look at the, the, the user experience in search is very important here. And, um, it's, it's actually as important as the back end. And um, we should always uh, elicitate, and it's, it's, it's more like a top-down approach where the user actually doesn't know exactly what he's looking for. And we need to um, bring the user to find his answer by himself. Uh, and then what turned out to happen actually inside the company when we're talking to the end user is that, uh, you know, what would you ask if uh, you were in front of a human that knows everything? Um, what would you ask him to know about uh, the information that you're looking for? And they would never know what to ask. Uh, I, th I think it's more like we've, we're used to a way to search that uh, we, uh, when we search on Google, we type uh, keywords. It's changing. It's, it's going towards a more cognitive way, but uh, it's going towards this, this direction. But there is, there is a long path uh, through this. Uh, I'm just going to give you um, some, some guidelines about the future works, uh, and, and I really uh, encourage you to, to go through it and uh, try to, to bring some, uh, some value to what we've been working on. Um, the idea is that we would want to change the model, uh, the reader model, and change it with the state of the art. Um, now the state of the art is BERT, and it's actually the one that is beating the human, uh, the human performance. And uh, Bert, to give you uh, some ideas, uh, some feeling about what this is, is a um, it's basically a pre-trained model that you could train that you could fine-tune for any NLP task. Uh, it has been it has been built by the Google AI research team, and uh, it's state of the art for the for the squad squad data set for the challenge. Uh, but the thing is that for us, it was taking a lot of uh, um, memory, so. Uh, but I, I definitely encourage you uh, to, to have a look and see. Uh, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, they applied it on Squad. So uh, if you want to apply it for, for uh, the natural language search, uh, it's basically uh, you compute the probability of a token being the start, a token being the end, and you just try to maximize this, this pair uh, of the two tokens. So it's just adding one layer above the general BERT uh, model. So that's it for us. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this talk. And, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, guys. Any question? Um, where could we get the slides? Because uh, I think for me, at I least it that, was information overload. Uh, uh, that's easy. I think we, we will share it. Yeah, we'll put it wherever. <laughs> I think the conference has uh, some uh, websites where we share the slides. But uh, we'll probably make it available on our GitHub anyway. So. I mean, the whole idea is open source. You know, it doesn't make sense to say we are open sourcing and then we don't share the presentation, you know, so that's not the spirit. So. Hi. Um, did you check what the users find about this, uh, this product? Were they, were, were they happy? Uh, yes, so if most of the feedback, they were happy. Uh, if I can give you some numbers, uh, usually they were taking 15 minutes to search for the answer. And here they were saying that they would gain five minutes in the search task. So they were happy. Um, and yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in general, we tried to apply it to other use cases as well. So this was specific to factory workers where, you know, they are, let's say, I mean, uh, not the most technical. 
but we also tried to apply it to other use cases like where it was more like financial documents or where it was financial analysts and things like that. And uh, I think in general, I would say it's mixed, you know, and I think one of the things to keep in mind is like Louis was mentioning in his takeaway is the UI. We should never underestimate the UI. You know, all the F5 scores, all the F1 scores, they don't matter to the end user. What they see is, so they really appreciate it that they can see the feedback, they can, and so they can see the preview of the documents, they can, uh, if it doesn't work, they always have a fallback where they can, you know, see, let's say, the full document and they can do whatever they search. So I think it's very important what we see with chatbots as well and things like that. Fallback is very important, whatever you design. It's always good to give the users like full control. Okay, if it doesn't work, you can still access the documents. It's not like it doesn't stop you. But uh, okay, thanks. Uh, does it ha handle multiple languages? The question answering, or it just handles English? Is it English only, or I think DRQA we can handle yeah, so this, right? DRQA is English only. Um, but if you if you, if you manage to bring BERT to the pipeline, uh, I think you can go multi-language. Um, yeah. And uh, does it handle semantics, uh, like, or does it uh, is it just uh, factual question answering, uh, like some semant if we if the query contains some semantics in question? So do you do you mean an understanding? Uh, technical keywords, or do you mean uh, uh, answering the semantic of, of the questions? Is that? Yeah, so I, th I think the way it has been trained is uh, they look at natural language question. So it will understand through the model um, the, the semantic. Uh, it's not knowledge graph or anything. So. Yeah, that's that's the whole point of of the of the reader the machine comprehension model. Yeah, I think we are not. I think semantics is like uh, you know very vague. But I think what DRQA does is uh, it recognizes the context. So it's a bit more than just EFIDF where you are playing with the frequency of the words. So I think even if you have the same frequency of the words in two places in the document, it will try to, because that's the bidirectional part of the RNN it is using, you know, where it's able to go back to what was said before, and also a bit in front where, you know, so I think that's the only thing it does. It takes a bit of the context in terms of what is said before and after the actual answer span, but I'm not sure if you would call it uh, semantics as in fully understanding the context of the, but it's a bit better than just keyword-based, frequency-based search. Hmm? Is okay. Um, just adding on my uh, my knowledge is extremely limited. But when you are using neural network, I do not think you consider semantics at all. Like uh, again, depends how you define semantics. You know, so here semantics is a bit like looking behind and what has happened before and what is happening a bit in the, that's how language translation works as well, you know, what you see as like autocorrect, uh, autocomplete in this kind of search engines is basically a recurrent neural network which is looking behind what you have typed before and, you know, what users would usually type in that context, so, but I don't think it really understands what you're thinking in your mind or, you know, that, that semantics is not there, so. Hello. Um, are you using user feedback to upgrade your knowledge base? If a user types a query and they're happy with the answer, are oh, you yeah. taking any, any action, something no, like No, absolutely. I think that's a bit like the key feature part of the user experience where we are logging everything that is being asked. And uh, what we try to do initially is that at least in the use cases when we roll it out, at least initially we do almost like a weekly review of the logs to see what questions are being asked and how we can tune it better, you know. But uh, it's easy to say it in theory, difficult to do it a bit in practice because once you roll it out, there is less... Uh, uh, but it's a bit like, uh, you know, putting the right processes in place, but it's very important, I think. I suppose it's okay. So thanks, Zeb and Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we have a little.